My name is Dr. Lawrence Pilevsky. I'm a pediatrician, um, originally trained at NYU School of Medicine, graduated in 1987, finished my residency at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York in 1990, and did a fellowship at the Bellevue Hospital in the outpatient department. The first nine years of my career were spent in ERs, running an intensive care unit, working in a neonatal intensive care unit, working inpatient in the hospital, working in a, a clinic, and then eventually having a private practice. In 1983, when I started medical school, I was taught vaccines were safe and they were effective and give them. But I was not taught about any of the science around their safety or any of the studies around how safety were done. And it wasn't until 1998 that a mother came up to me and said, Dr. Larry, did you know that there's mercury in vaccines? And I said, no, I did not. And as a medical student, I was trained to critically think. If you see an observation, you go after it and try and figure out if there's a question to ask. So instead of just ignoring it, I looked further into the vaccine ingredients. And I found that there were a number of vaccine ingredients that in animal studies were proven to be very dangerous to animals. And I didn't understand why these same ingredients were actually in vaccines. I was starting to hear stories from parents, not dozens, not hundreds, but thousands of stories from parents who took a very healthy child into their doctor's office and then found that their child lost much of their health, whether it was their speech, whether it was seizures, whether it was death, whether it was asthma, allergies, eczema, whether it was autism, whether it was learning disabilities, whether it was inflammatory bowel disease, autoimmune diseases. And every one of those parents were told it had nothing to do with the vaccine. Every single one. And this continues today. But yet when I look at the ingredients that are in the vaccines, I have the science to actually explain how these medical problems could be happening in these children. Today, one in, chi one in child in five is learning disabled. In 1976, it was one in 17. One in six under age eight, one in two adolescents, and one in four young adults is diagnosed with a mental, behavioral, or emotional disorder. One in 20 children under the age of five have seizures. One in child in 40 develops autism. The number of cases of children and adults with autoimmune diseases is rising exponentially. It's one of the highest rising diseases in this country. And the vaccine ingredients, if you are willing to look at them and understand how they work when they're injected into the body, can be seen to be responsible for every single one of these cases. So what are these ingredients? Well, when I was in medical school, we were taught that the body has something called the blood-brain barrier. The blood-brain barrier is like Fort Knox to the brain. Elements of the bloodstream cannot get into the brain. And those elements include drugs, viruses, and bacteria, among other things that are in the blood. Drug companies were very concerned about being able to develop drugs to get the drugs into the brain. And so they used something called a nanoparticle. A nanoparticle, very small particle, bound to the drug. And they found that if they could put a nanoparticle onto a drug, they could get that drug to go into the brain. And it shows in animal studies that they were able to do this. They then were able to take an emulsifier, which is something that's good with water and fat. It can dissolve in both. And if they added the emulsifier to the nanoparticle bound to the drug, they could increase drug entry into the brain 20-fold. This is right out of animal studies that I found. So you have a drug, you have a nanoparticle, and you have this emulsifier. The vaccines are constructed the same way. You have the vaccine viruses and bacteria that are bound to a nanoparticle called aluminum. And that aluminum is a nanoparticle. And by definition, a nanoparticle has the potential to enter the brain. 
Most vaccines also contain polysorbate 80 or sorbitol. Both of those compounds are emulsifiers. Emulsifiers bind very tightly to the nanoparticle aluminum, which is bound very tightly to the vaccine antigens. This raises a question. If the vaccine model is the same model as the model that the drug companies are using to enhance the delivery of drugs into the brain, is it possible that vaccine ingredients are making their way into the brain of our children that could explain why so many parents are watching their kids deteriorate after vaccinations, even though the doctors, the media, and the government say absolutely no connection, even though the science suggests that there is. You cannot find a single study in the literature that addresses whether the injection of aluminum into the body penetrates the brain, whether any vaccine ingredients enter the brain, and whether polysorbate 80 enhances the delivery of any of those ingredients into the brain. And when I could not find those studies, I was concerned. Because I'm told, you're told, vaccines are evaluated and very, very distinctly tested for safety. But yet, you cannot find a study that says, does aluminum stay in the, get into the brain of children? Does aluminum take other vaccine ingredients into the brain that don't belong in the brain? Because when ingredients get across the blood-brain barrier that don't belong in the brain, they cause inflammation. And inflammation is what we see in one in five children with learning disabilities and one in 40 children with autism. And we have an, you, all you have to do is ask the guidance counselors, and if you get honest pediatricians who are telling you what they're seeing in their practice, they're seeing kids one after another with more and more um, brain disorders. Now, as a medical doctor who was taught to think, I then went into the literature and said, are, are proper science studies done, safety studies, where you take a vaccine and you inject it into 100 kids, and then you give 100 kids a saline placebo, meaning it's inert. No study exists to actually evaluate the safety of a vaccine compared to a placebo group. None. When vaccine, safeties, when vaccines are studied, the maximum amount of days that vaccines are studied are up to 10 days to two weeks. And unfortunately, the vaccine manufacturers pre-select what side effects they will allow to be associated with the vaccines. So if a child has a vaccine reaction that is associated with the vaccine, the vaccine manufacturers will decide whether or not it should or should not be associated with the vaccine. And the public knows this, and they're learning it more and more. So if your child develops seizures five months after a vaccine, your child is told by the doctor that it had nothing to do with the vaccine. But that's not true because there are no studies to prove it. There's opinion, but there's never been a study really addressing whether a vaccination at two months or even nine hours of age could be related to an event that happened months or even years later. And yet, we have some of the sickest children in our country. In New York, we lost the religious exemption on June 13th because the unvaccinated children with a religious exemption were blamed for a measles outbreak. When I met with representatives in New York, I told them that there is no study to prove that unvaccinated children have ever been proven to start an epidemic. And he was surprised. And he said, I will vote against removing the religious exemption if I can't find a study, like you say. He could not find a study, but he voted to repeal the exemption anyway. Because there are no studies. There are no studies proving that unvaccinated children are responsible there's consensus, and here's why there's consensus. We are taught that vaccines stop the children from carrying the germs 
that we are vaccinating against. And study after study shows that children who are vaccinated can still carry the germ despite having received the vaccine. So the vaccinated are still capable of spreading disease, but the unvaccinated are being unfairly blamed because of a consensus opinion, but not true science. To repeat, no study, no science has ever proven that vaccines eliminate the existence of the organism in your body. If anything, science is showing that the vaccines cause the organisms to mutate. And there are plenty of articles showing that strains are replaced by new strains after vaccination, similarly to the way antibiotics are bringing about new strains of bacteria because of the overuse of antibiotics. So why are we blaming the unvaccinated children? No study has ever been done in this country appropriately to address the health outcomes of children who are vaccinated versus the children who are unvaccinated. I have been seeing families in my practice for over 20 years that have opted out of vaccination. They are the healthiest children I have ever seen. I have families who have older children who have been vaccinated, middle children who have been partially vaccinated, and then younger children who have not been vaccinated at all. And those families are rising in number and they see the difference between the health outcomes of their younger children who are rarely sick versus their older children who are getting IEPs in schools, needing medications, ERs, and constant uh, health issues. And all I get when I hear that, when I state something like that is, well, that's anecdotal. Well, it's anecdotal if you see it a couple of times, but it's not anecdotal when you see it for over 20 years and when you speak to parents and when you speak to teachers and when you speak to guidance counselors and when I speak to pediatricians who are too afraid to come out in public. There is pressure to ostracize the families who know the science and know the lack of science that's available. There's a lot of consensus. And when I think about the subject of vaccination, I want to ensure that if we're going to prevent infectious diseases in children, that we don't create something worse in its place. Unfortunately, we're dealing with a lot of beliefs instead of actual science. And beliefs go a long way. I took the oath of first do no harm, but when I look into the science and I don't see long-term studies, and I see only short-term studies up to four to 10 days where the side effects are are manipulated by the manufacturers who are the only ones doing the studies on the vaccines. And when I see no placebo groups and I see no studies of the single ingredients or the combined ingredients, and I see the science, the biochemistry of the ingredients in animal studies where animals who are given the aluminum are found to have motor delays and behavioral problems which is a great deal of what we're seeing in children today. I say, are we first doing no harm? And so first do no harm means the precautionary principle. And more and more parents are understanding the dangers of vaccines. And that's why we're seeing such pressure to mandate vaccines because more of the science is coming out. In order to create herd immunity, you have to be able to prove that children who are vaccinated are immune. And the sad part about that is that whenever you vaccinate a population of children, you're always going to have a population that doesn't develop any antibodies at all. The estimates of that are about 10% that vaccines will fail in 10% of the population. Vaccination, no antibody production. But the next group is even more suspicious. 
because when you vaccinate and you do produce an antibody, there is science to show that the presence of an antibody doesn't guarantee immunity either. And we don't know the percentage of children who get an a, a vaccine, develop an antibody, but aren't immune at all. We assume that if we vaccinate, we're getting protection. We assume that if we vaccinate, we're stopping spread of disease. Those are assumptions that have never been solidified in science. And I'm happy to offer more explanations during the Q&A. I wouldn't say that if I didn't have the science to prove it. The parents that I work with in New York that I see around the country are very concerned that their rights are being taken away, that their knowledge about the science is being pushed away by an agenda that only says unvaccinated children are a problem. Just to wrap up, in New York when we had the measles outbreak, I'm sorry, in California when they had a measles outbreak, there were 194 cases. Of the 194 cases, 73 cases were due to the actual virus in the vaccine itself. 73, 38%. 73 cases were due to the measles virus causing measles. All the literature states that measles virus infection is not true measles and should not be counted as a health threat. That means only 121 kids developed measles, 121 people. New York State did not do the proper testing that's, that's given down by the CDC to test every child to see if the children had measles strain, wild type measles, or a mutated measles. There are cases around the country and around the world where in a 95 to 98% vaccinated population, they had measles outbreaks because they found mutated viruses. There, as I said before, there are cases where the virus mutates, where there are strain replacements. New York State did not do the proper testing of the thousand plus young children and adults who came down with measles. They wrote a little blurb on the CDC website of the two wild viruses that were responsible for the measles outbreak. But we in New York know that the testing was not done. 4,200 kids on Long Island had the religious exemption and were not vaccinated. And there was not one case of measles on Long Island. Thank you.